So welcome. Uh, my name is Heikki Linnagangas. I work for Pivotal currently. Uh, I'm here to talk about indexes and the way indexes look. Um, this is a presentation that actually grew out of some discussions, informal discussions I had a few years back at the PGCon when uh, I started drawing these graphs on the chalkboard when someone asked, what I mean, what does a gene index look like, or maybe it was gist, and uh, kind of went through a few of these different index types on a chalkboard explaining how the structure looks like, and I figured, hey, this would actually be a pretty good presentation topic uh, to do this, uh, go through all of them, and that's, that's what I've done. So there are five, uh, there are five index methods that I'm going to cover, index access methods in PostgreSQL that I'm, that I'm going to cover. Uh, it says 9.5. I don't believe there were any new ones in 9.6. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is also hash indexes, which I'm not going to cover because they, you should not use them in production at the moment. They are not while logged and they don't perform better than the B tree. Uh, Although when I came here, I've been speaking to Amit Kapila and Lacey, who are working on making it faster and making it while logged. So maybe next year I'll have to update this presentation to also cover hash indexes if they, if they actually become usable. Uh, so that would be great, but we'll see. But for now, I'm, I'm going to skip over them. Uh, but before we go into the, into the indexes, I want to talk about the heap. Uh, the heap is where we store all the rows in your table. So when you do a create table, you get a heap. Uh, it's unordered, so if you do insert, the it, it, uh, new tuple goes wherever, uh, usually at the end until you delete something and you make space. Uh, but it's, it's randomly ordered. Uh, it is divided into eight kilobyte blocks unless you compile yourself with a different size. But you know, for the purpose of this presentation, let's assume that it's eight kilobytes. Uh, the, all the blocks are numbered from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 6, and so forth. It's a 32-bit integer we use to represent that. And uh, within each page, there is a slot, uh, so to speak, for each tuple. And some of the slots can be empty. Um, so if you want to know the physical location of a tuple, uh, you can always address them by saying with the block number and which slot or which item on the page. Um, this, uh, and that is how we point to tuples in the indexes too. You can actually see this, these uh, tips or item pointers if you do select CTID from table or select CTID comma star from table, then you can see these physical log, uh, identifiers of physical locations of each tuple. And that's, if you haven't, if you've never done that, that's something you should probably do just to see what it looks like. So there's a hidden system column that you don't normally get, but if you explicitly say CTID from table, you will see that. Uh, and that's the physical location of each tuple in the, in the, in the table. So that is unique to each tuple and each tuple version. So if you do an update, for example, you get the new version of the, of the row goes to a separate uh, place and it will have its own uh, TID or item pointer. So that's what all of the indexes are about. They are all about storing some sort of key information and a TID which points to the physical location of that tuple in the heap. So all of these index types I'm going to cover, except for Brin, uh, will store a TID of that tuple. And also there's no visibility information in indexes, so for the purposes of this presentation and as far as indexes are concerned, we don't need to care about visibility. Um, is this tuple dead? Is it updated? Can I see this? Uh, none of that matters. The indexes don't care about that. Uh, the visibility information is stored in the heap and uh, after you've looked up a row from the index, we check the visibility elsewhere. Uh, so the index access methods uh, don't need to care about that. Uh, whenever you do an update, that always results in a new, new tuple in the index. Uh, so even if you have a unique index, there are actually duplicates in the index, uh, but none of them is visible at the same time. Uh, that's taken care of elsewhere. So again, the index doesn't need to care about that. Uh, another characteristic of uh, indexes in Postgres is that there is no operation to delete one tuple from an index. It's always a bulk operation that's done by vacuum. So when you vacuum, it actually scans through every index completely. And for each tuple in the index, it will ask, 
is this dead, is this dead, is this dead, and it will do that in bulk and uh, collect all the dead tuples away from the index. Uh, so there is no retail delete this one tuple operation at all in, in PostgreSQL. So let's start with the first index uh, access method. This is the B tree. Uh, yeah, question. The question is, what about index-only scans? Do we also check the heap for index-only scans? Uh, no, for index-only scans, we don't check the heap. We check the uh, visibility map that's kind of attached to the heap. Uh, so it works that way. It's, again, the index doesn't need to care about that. The ind for an index-only scan, the index just returns the key that you got from the index and the TID, and the rest of the system will figure out whether it's visible and whether you actually have to go and check the information from the heap or if you can use that, uh, that, that as it is. Uh, so the indexes don't need to care about index-only scans either uh, in that sense. Uh, so the B tree is the, probably the, I mean, that's the most common index type in any database. Uh, if you do just create index, that's what you will get. Uh, the characteristics of an index, a B tree index, is that you store the tuples in sorted order. For example, if you have the names of cities, uh, they will be in sorted order. This is a, if you have a very small table and it all fits on a single index page, that's what it's going to look like. You just have a single page and that's, you have all your keys there. And you can see the item pointers that point to the actual tuple in the heap. Uh, when you search this thing, you just do a binary search. If you're, if you're looking for Athens, you do a binary search to uh, find that. So far, so good. Uh, now that you have a slight, little bit more data, uh, it doesn't fit on a single index page anymore, then we add another index page, uh, and you continue the tuples there. And we also have pointers that link the pages together, so you kind of have this linked list of pages at the leaf level. Mm. We use those pointers if you do, uh, if you do scans like select star where or, uh, select star where uh, key is greater than something. We will find the first location and then we just follow the pointers through the linked list uh, to find all of them, and you, you return all of them. Or we can do backward scans by following the back pointers. Uh, now to be actually useful, we of course have an upper layer, so. We will also have the root page, which points to these leaf level pages. Um, this is probably fairly standard stuff if you studied uh, taking a course on, on databases. Or some, and anywhere, I'm sure this is a data structure that um, you will go through. Um, one interesting feature of the B tree, the way it's implemented in Postgres, is that uh, all of these pointers at the higher levels, they're kind of optional. Uh, you can still, the, Three still works perfectly okay or correctly for searches, even if you're missing something from the root page. For example, if you, for any reason, you don't have the pointer to that middle page there, uh, all the scans still work. Uh, what will happen is that the scan will go to the previous page and it will notice, hey, hang on, this tuple I'm looking for isn't actually here, and it will scan forward uh, by following these uh, pointers. Uh, that was an invention by guys called Lehmann and Yao, it's a very, again, it's a very standard database technique, or pretty much everyone does this uh, with small variations. Uh, the cool thing about, about that uh, property that you can always, it still works if you're missing one of those uh, pointers, is that we use that during splits. So the way splitting works is that we just split the page and then after we've done that, we go and add the pointer to the parent, and that makes the locking uh, well, more, you, you can do it more concurrently, basically. But it's also a very handy feature for correctness purposes. So if, if it gets corrupt somehow, it usually still kind of works. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't happen too often, but it, it's useful. Uh, so some uh, Postgres peculiarities of the B3, we, the way we've implemented it is that uh, first of all, if a page becomes completely empty, then we unlink it from the tree and the, we recycle it and so forth. But we never try to merge like half-empty pages. So if you have a 
tree like this and you delete everything except the single row, you just leave one row on each of these tuples, uh, we will not shrink your index. You will have a lot of free space on each of these pages and uh, it gets bloated, but that's the way it is. Yeah, question. Uh, it could be, right, so the question was, well, did, did I mean that it might, the link might not be there perman permanently or just temporarily? Uh, so yeah, there are situations, normal situations during page splitting and so forth when, when we're missing a link temporarily. Uh, also after, if you crash at the right moment, it might be that we've already split the page but we haven't yet inserted the, the pointer to the parent and so it's kind of permanent in, in that case. Uh, but there's a system that the next time you update it, we will go and fix that situation um, after, after a crash. So yeah, the, the, all the searches will work, whether it's permanent or temporary. Uh, it should only be temporary, uh, but if it isn't for some reason, then it will hopefully get fixed later on. Um, the lemon and yao don't go into the details with crash recovery and so forth, uh, but the way the page splitting, the, te the way we temporarily don't have the link, uh, that's from Lehman and Yao. But uh, they don't go into all of these details. We kind of have to figure out some of them ourselves. Uh, so one problem you can have with the B3 in Postgres is that you can have, uh, if you, for example, do a lot of inserts and then you delete 90% of the data you just inserted and then you again insert a lot of data, delete 90% of what you just inserted, you can end up with a B3 that uh, contains a lot of free space and it can be bloated. Uh, so you might need to re-index in that case to get rid of that problem. It doesn't happen too often. I, I haven't, I've never seen that personally being a big problem myself, but then again, I don't administer any production databases. So I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, question. Uh, no, those are not. Uh, so, so when a, so you said a picture you can empty of all the links to the group. So in another case, could you become very, very full and like very, very large with a bunch of empty and inaccurate <coughs> tags, right? Yeah. Um, so do you, do you have to do a re-index to be to a point where you're shrinking the information that's in your data to make sure that, or how does that, how does that system usually work where it decides Uh, it's not, it's, yeah, so this, this, the question was how do, you, it was a long question. Uh, <laughs> how do you rebalance this tree when you have to re-index? Uh, so if you have the situation that you have a page that's almost empty except that there's a single tuple left, uh, we don't, I mean, that's just the way it is. We don't try to do anything special about that. If a page becomes full, then it's split. Um, and the way the re-index works, it just rewrites the whole index completely. Uh, we could have, I mean, you could easily see that you could write better ways to do this. You could easily have a background worker that kind of tries to merge and rebalance or you know, squeeze out some pages, but no one's bothered to do that. Uh, there's some thorny locking and concurrency issues there to make it safe if you're also scanning or reading the index at the same time. Yeah, the most the the worst case scenario is that you have just a single city or a single tuple on each page. Yes, and yeah, that can it can be, become large. Uh, it doesn't happen too often in practice, but it can. Yes. So uh, the question was, do we create another level the index when a page gets full? Uh, the way it works is that the splitting always works bottom up. So if one of the leaf pages get full, we split that page. And after we've done that, we go and insert the pointer to the parent. If the parent becomes full when we're doing that, then we have to split that too and insert the pointer to that internal page to the, to the next level and so forth. Uh, when the root page becomes full, uh, then we split the root page and we create a new level and create a new root page that points to those halves. Yeah, we, uh, 
So the question was, do, do this have to complete before the transaction closes? Yeah, we do all of these uh, splits and insertions into the parent as part of the insert itself. So it happens at the moment that you do the insert. Um, if you crash in the middle of that, then, you, then we will have the situation where you're missing some of these pointers, but we, it will get fixed later on the next update. And uh, again, the, the index code doesn't care about transactions. Uh, it's, it, it, it's irrelevant to the index whether it's actually commit, if, whether you commit or not, it's still gonna be, the row is still gonna be there in the index. Uh, another point is that we use the free space map to track where if, you com if you have these completely, full uh, completely empty pages and you recycle them, we use the free space map to uh, keep track of that. Uh, so yeah, once, once you fill the internal pages, then we create a new level and so forth. You, in practice, you will never see an index that's more than I don't know, maybe four or five levels deep. Um, you can artificially create a situation that's worse than that if you have very wide keys, uh, but uh, it's kind of, it's exponential, so you, every time you add a level, you can double the size, or not even that, you can multiply it by 100 or something. Uh, so you don't get very deep uh, trees in practice. A side note, in Postgres, uh, all of these index types, except gist, <laughs> which was a mistake, but I'll, I'll cover that later. Uh, all of these uh, index types have a magic block, or what we call the meta page, that's the first page, physically the first page in the file, uh, the block number is zero in the index. Uh, we have a meta page, which uh, the format is different for all, all the index types, that, but it's a handy place that we store information like, okay, where is the root page? Because <laughs> when it can move around, when you have to split and create a new one, uh, it doesn't stay on the same location. Uh, and there's some other information like, okay, so how deep is this page? And I think we cache something there, and there's a, I'm not gonna go into details, there's a thing called fast root if you shrink an index a lot, and so forth. Uh, so the complete B tree looks like this, uh, isn't it beautiful? There's the meta page at the fixed location, and it points to the root, and then you have a tree structure. Uh, you can do a lot of interesting stuff with this, typically you can find, I mean, where something equals something, that's what an index is good for. <laughs> Uh, with an B tree, you can also do scans with greater than or less than. You can, you can do order by, just select star from table, order by something. It, you can use an index for that, um, so you don't need to sort. Uh, we also support with some, I, I don't remember what the conditions are, but in some cases you can, we can convert a like query like that uh, uh, so that we find everything that begins with foo in the index. Uh, so cool, that's what the B tree is. The next index I'm gonna cover is the gin index. Uh, the reason I'm gonna cover that next is that the gin is, is pretty close to a B tree actually. Uh, the, I mean the use cases are quite different. You use a gin for a full text search and uh, things like that. That's the typical use case. Uh, but actually internally a gin index looks a lot like a B tree. It's, it's a B tree, but it's optimized to store a lot of duplicate keys. That's the defining property of a gene index. Because in a normal B tree, if you have like a million rows that all have the same key, it's not very efficient at packing them. Uh, gene is. Uh, another important property is that if we're, when we have these duplicates, they're ordered. The duplicates are ordered in in, in the order in the physical order of the heap TIDs. Uh, so. It, it allows us to do some nice tricks there at scan time. But uh, in this presentation, I'm not gonna go into much details on how the gene searches work and how we use this index. I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna focus on the on-disk structure and the kind of the page layout, the tree layout of that. Uh, another interesting property of gene, or a very important property of gene is that when you insert a single row into the heap, uh, you, we extract multiple keys from that single heap row and we index all of them in, in the same index. In a normal B tree, you can only have one key per one row that you insert, but with gin, there's multiple. But again, that doesn't actually affect the on-disk layout at all. It's just all at the higher levels and how we use this B tree. And for some reasons I'm gonna cover later, we only support bitmap scans uh, with gin, so you can't do order by and so forth with gin. Uh, so this is for the gin 
tree looks like, gene entry tree as it's called, uh, it looks like a bee tree because it is a bee tree. Uh, there's some minor differences. We don't have the back pointers. Uh, we only have the forward pointers in the in the uh, in these pages, so you can do a backward scan from the gene gene index. We've never needed that, although there's no theoretical reason why you couldn't implement that. But you just haven't. Uh, but it's a it's again it's a works similarly to the normal B tree, although the code is completely different. It's a completely separate implementation from the normal B tree, but it's it's a B tree nevertheless. Uh, but what I said, it's very efficient at storing duplicates. Uh, there are three ways we can store the heap TIDs in, the, in this. Uh, if you have just a single row with a single, if you, if you don't have any duplicates, so if you insert a single row of foobar into the, into the index and the, that's the only row that has that key, we store it just like the normal B tree, just a single TID attached to the key. If there are multiple rows with the key foobar, uh, then we collect the heap TIDs of all of them and we attach them all to the single index tuple. So there's foobar and then the list of all of the TIDs that had that key. And if you have even more, we should have a graph here. If you have even more, then we create what we call a posting tree. So in the main B tree, we just have a pointer to another page and then that page is full of all of the TIDs that happen to have this, this key. Uh, so you might have foobar there with a pointer saying, okay, there were so many foobars in this table that you know, there's this whole new page that contains the, the tits to all of them. And if, even, if it doesn't fit on a single page, even the list of tits, then we have another tree uh, that contains all of the TIDs. But at the high level, it's a B tree. Uh, now there's an interesting feature in Jin called fast updates, uh, which means slow queries, but fast updates. Uh, so if you insert the Jin index, we don't put it in the tree immediately. We just put it to a separate list. We just collect it there, uh, which is just a bag of tuples that we've recently inserted, uh, so that we don't need to traverse the whole index yet. Uh, and whenever you search, we search the tree, but we also search this fast update list. And uh, Vacuum is responsible for m cleaning this list and putting all the pending items into the list proper. Uh, in practice, I don't think a lot of users like this very much because it does make the searching a lot slower because you have the search, every search has to scan this whole list. So there's an option to turn it off and uh, I was just listening to Vladimir's talk on how they used Jin in Yandex, and he just, as a side note, he just said something like, yeah, we use Jin, and we turn fast update off, of course. <laughs> he didn't go into details on why, but uh, yeah, so a lot of people just turn it off. Anyway, it's there. Uh, so this is what the complete Jin index looks like on disk. There is a meta page. Uh, it points to the root of the entry tree, which is the main B tree that contains all the keys. And there's also a pointer to this fast update list, which is just a sequential list of pages. Uh, and that's what it looks like. Any questions on Jim? No? How is it used? How is it used? That's a good question. Uh, so you can do similar operations that you can with a B3. You can do where something equals something. Uh, it's typically used with full text search. So you have, you index a lot of keys and then you search for something that, and all the rows that contains <coughs> specific key. Um, so basically then you search for all the documents that have keys in the comments. Yeah. And those, are, those become separate terms and you go to separate posting trees. So if you search for hey, killing the gangs in this tree, they, yeah, they become separate. Uh, there are separate keys in the main tree. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of smarts in how that works. Uh, so if you search for hey key and Linda Kanga, so you want to have all the rows that contain both of those, then we, do, we effectively do two scans of the index. And then when we have, I remember that I said earlier that the list of the TIDs is in sorted order. So once you've found uh, kind of the root of hey key and hey Linda Kanga, then we walk them walk uh, in lockstep find everything that contained both. Uh, so there's a lot of smarts in Jin. Uh, 
on how we actually do these searches. Uh, but it doesn't show up in the uh, index structure. If you just look at the way it's in the, on the disk, it's, it doesn't show up there. Uh, but there's a lot of cool code in how we use the index. Uh, yeah, so the, is the, is the question is, is the general strategy to decide whether you use the normal B3 or gene? Is, the, is it how many duplicates you have? Uh, yeah. Also, whether you want to support backward scans, whether you need to support the ra you know, range queries. If you're trying to do things like and 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 not, then yeah, the gene will work better. I mean, you can't use the normal B3 for full text search, for example, because there is no support for extracting multiple keys from a single tuple. So if you're trying to insert Heiki Linna Kangas uh, in a gin, you would index Heiki and you would index Linna Kangas separately. But the normal B3 code doesn't know how to do that. Um, that is something I'd like to change. Uh, there is no fundamental reason why we need to have separate B3 and a separate gin, because they could be just no one, uh, one code that can handle both cases, but it's uh, not, not today. Um, oh, but yeah, you can use gin. If you have a lot of duplicates, you, you might want to use gin just because it, it's a lot smaller than a normal B tree in that case, even though you could use B tree. Yes, another question. So the question is, yeah, if you have a lot of duplicates, then Jin puts them all on one line, unless that the line becomes even wider than it puts it on a page. And if it doesn't see it on a page, it puts it on multiple pages, but yeah. Yeah, I probably should. Right, I probably should have had a slide on how people actually use the gene index. So, so for full text. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the gene supports very different operations because it was, uh, it was well, we implemented it that way. We could have done it differently, but uh, it's a. We, Yeah, there's those the yeah, so there's a country mod module gene B3 or B3 gene uh, that kind of implements all the normal B3 operations. Uh, you can, for all of the normal data types, like just integers, you can use the gene index with integers <laughs> with that. Uh, even though normally you p people use it for full text. So normally people use this for full text search, and the way it works there is that you extract every word and you index every word separately. Another use case, if you have an array, you can build a gene index on that, and the way it works, it extracts each element of the array, and it indexes every element separately. So then you can do queries like, give me all the rows that contained an array that had this element in it. Uh, JSON now too, yeah, that's a good point. Change of, with JSON also, we take the document, we split, we take every key and every value in the document and we index them separately as a, uh, in, the, in a single gene index. And then you could do stuff like, give me all the JSON documents that had this uh, key value pair, um, no matter how deep it is in the tree and so forth. So that's the, that's the, yeah, that's the typical use case for gene. You have something that you can split into multiple keys and you index each of them uh, separately. Next topic, the gist index. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of index types. So gist is also a tree structure, but it's not a B tree. Uh, in, in a B tree, 
we had all the tuples in order on the single page. So you had A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you can do a binary search to f uh, within the page to find, find a specific thing. In GIST, we don't do that. Uh, it's just a page, it, GIST page is just a bag of, of entries and they're in random order within the page. Uh, the defining characteristic of GIST is that you can have the pages, when, when you do an insert, you can legitimately put it anywhere in the index, uh, except that if you do that, then it will become slow. Uh, but there is no single correct location for a new, new tuple that you insert. It can go into a lot of different places, and uh, that only affects the speed of searches, but it's still going to be correct. Uh, so now I'm actually going to go through how, what a use case for this. <laughs> If you imagine that you have a range type, it could be a range of dates, for example, uh, 1st of January to 1st of April or something. And you have uh, the rows in your table with these ranges. Um, and the query that we're trying to satisfy is, find me all the ranges that overlap with this range. Uh, so you can think of it like this. I mean, how do you find everything that overlaps? If we tried to use a normal B3 for this, you would have to sort all of these ranges by something. Uh, we could sort them by the begin date, for example, and then you get an order like this. And now to do the search, you would have to scan everything up to this point uh, because you don't know whether they're going to overlap. But once you hit that point, you see that, OK, everything that's after that has got to be it can't overlap because the begin date is larger than the end date here. Uh, but that's obviously not very good for your search. You have to scan all of these to find everything that overlaps. Uh, so you only, on average, you're going to scan half of your data on every, every query. So it's not, you can't do that easily with the B tree. The other option would be to sort by the maximum date, but then you just have the inverse problem. You have to scan everything. Um, everything after, no wait, everything after this certain point. Uh, so that doesn't really help either. You can't sort by mean or the beginning and end at the same time with a normal B tree. What you would like to do is to somehow clump together these ranges that have, are kind of roughly similar, have, have a roughly similar range. So you might have one bucket with these ranges, another bucket with these ranges, and a third bucket that covers everything else, basically. Uh, and now when you do a search, you can see that, OK, nothing in this bucket matches, nothing in that bucket matches. And then you drill into that, that bucket that, that matched. And that's the basic idea of a gist. Um, these buckets that I described, you, they could be gist pages. So the way gist works, it tries to cluster your data uh, so that there's as little overlap as possible, and it's up to you to decide what overlap means in this case, or it's up to the whoever wrote the operator class to decide what overlap means. Uh, but for example, for ranges, it's pretty straightforward. Or for uh, if you want to index bounding boxes, for example, it's you know you can visually see what overlap means in that case. Uh, so the basic idea of gist is to cluster your data into something that are close together, and then you can do searches uh, like that. Mm. So an example, let's continue with the example of ranges. In this case, it's ranges of numbers. Uh, if you have a single, a very small table, and uh, your gist index fits on a single page, it's actually pretty useless because it's, there's no order within the page, so it doesn't actually do you any good. Uh, but that, I mean, when you start to build an index, it starts that way. So for each range, in this case, you store the key. And then in the key, in this case, is the range. And you store the TID that points to the heap tuple for that. Uh, you have one index tuple per heap tuple, like the B tree, but different from Gin. Uh, and again, it's unordered. Now, things get interesting as you have a bigger tree. And uh, in that case, you get this clustering I, I showed earlier. So you have you have these ranges that are kind of similar on one page, and you have these other ranges that are similar to each other on another page, and so on. 
And the root page now contains the minimum and maximum that covers everything that's on this page. So 10 is the smallest minimum value here, and 45 is the largest maximum value here. Um, now when you do a search for everything that overlaps, say from 55 to 60, uh, you just scan the root page for all, everything that overlaps, and then you dive into those pages that overlapped, and you can ignore the others. Mm, so that's how the just short search works. Now you can, you can easily see how this would work for, uh, well, I said bounding boxes if you want to index geographical data. Uh, this is typically used by PostGIS uh, for indexing, well, coordinates. Uh, that's a very typical use case. Uh, and in that, you know, you have overlaps and uh, you, so on. Um, so the interesting feature of GIST is that it's very loosely ordered. If you look at this tree, uh, we could move these uh, tuples around into completely random order at the leaf level, as long as we make sure that these minimum and maximum in the upper layer are correct. Uh, that will make searching a lot slower because then if they're not closely clustered, then every search will have to scan a lot of pages to find, find everything that can possibly match. Uh, and we actually had some bugs in this area in Postgres in previous releases where we had a very bad algorithm for choosing the way we, we cluster these tuples. And nobody noticed for quite a while because it was still correct. It was just not performing very well. Uh, so a lot depends on the algorithm you use to do this clustering. Yeah, question. So the question is, how do you, uh, is there an easy way to describe the algorithm we use to, to choose these uh, ranges? No, no, I could not describe it easily. It's, it's, it's complicated. I think the algorithm we currently use for all the built-in data types was written by Alexander Korotkov, who is in this conference, if you want to speak to him. Uh, I don't remember the details. Um, but there are, there are a lot of algorithms out there we could possibly use. Uh, but the way it works, the, when you're writing an operator class for your data type, the way it works that you have to define a function that when a page gets full, you need to split it. You define the algorithm to split the page and decide which tuple goes on which page. Uh, so you have to have a way to somehow separate things that are close to each other and things that are not. And then there's another algorithm, uh, another function you implement for uh, if when you're inserting a new tuple to decide where do you put it. Um, that means some data types have similar algorithms than others. Hmm? Yes, absolutely. So the data type the data type has to provide these functions and they can I mean, the implementation is totally up to you who write the data type. Uh, it can be completely different for different data types. Uh, there are a few standard algorithms in practice that most people use, or pretty much all of the data types use in practice, but it wouldn't have to be that way. You could write anything. Uh, so a GIST index has loose ordering. You can, it's not strictly ordered. Uh, and for example, for something like geographical types, you, there is no single order. If you, you can't do order by coordinates because there, there's no single ordering for that. Um, and any key can legitimately be stored anywhere in the tree, and it's just a performance that matters. On how do you how do you write these algorithms? So yeah, there's this big split algorithm for uh, big, split, big split function that decides where do you put the tuples when you split, and the choose function for when you're inserting on where do you put that. So it's used to do gist stuff. Uh, there's another interesting case the thing you can do with the gist index, which is the uh, nearest neighbor search, which, which is very handy for just, just systems. You can pick a point and you can find the 10 nearest neighbors of that point. Um, there's another support function that the data type author has to write uh, to support that, which gives a distance metric between two types, uh, two points. Uh, but, so it's typically used for, by PostGIS and other geographical stuff, but it's not only that. You can also 
use the gist index for uh, full text search and the int array. And I think both of these, both of these have a bitmap. I think for the int array, for example, for each element in the array, you set a bit that, uh, that acts like a fingerprint. And then when you go up the tree, instead of having like a bounding box, you have an or of all the bitmaps in the lower level. And it's kind of complicated. But the basic property of anything that you want to index with gist index is that you have some kind of concept of contains. Uh, for a bounding box, uh, it's a box that contains everything that's underneath it. For the interray uh, fingerprint mechanism, you define it so that it's the or of all of, the, of these bits at the lower level. And you could maybe see some other cases where you have this concept of something that contains everything that's below it. And uh, yeah, Andrew. Also use the exclusion. It's all, yeah, the, it's also used for exclusion constraints. Uh, Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, th so there the exclusion, const you can define an exclusion constraint as that constraints that you must not have any overlap between uh, things. So then it enforces that there is no overlap. We seem to be running out of time. I have two more index types to cover. Uh, <laughs> we will run out of time. If you have any questions on the things that we covered now, feel free to ask. No, in that case, I'll continue for SPGist, and I think I will have to skip Brin, unfortunately. Uh, space partition GIST, that's what SPGist stands for. Uh, this is completely different from GIST. Uh, it has pretty much nothing in common, uh, except that there are some common use cases. Uh, in GIST, you could have this overlap, and it was completely, it was, you were free to insert wherever you want. With SPGist, you definitely cannot. It's very well defined when you insert a new tuple where it has to go in the tree. It's a tree structure, but it's different from the B tree, and it's different from GIST in that it's not a balanced uh, tree. It's, it has a different depth in different branches. So it's more like, a, say, a binary search tree than, than a B tree. And uh, the nodes in the tree are not pages. With the B tree and GIST, uh, the nodes, the node in the tree was always a page, but with SPGs, that's not the case. So the, an example, <laughs> again, if you want to index the names of cities, in this case, you have a, a tree like this. So you have the root node, and under the root node, you, you have a branch in the tree for each, uh, the next character in the, in the string you're indexing and uh, the next character and the next character and so forth. And at the leaf level, you have the entry itself. Uh, it's not typically used for text, but it's a simpler example to, to show uh, because it's one dimensional. Uh, but for example, for points, you would have, you would divide the space. Um, there's no chalk here. Uh, for example, for point, if you wanted to index points, you would divide the space into quadrants, and then you would divide that into quadrants and quadrants. So you partition the space uh, into non-overlapping parts, and then every point has a location uh, in, in, that, in that tree. Uh, so it, the way that it then splits the, these nodes into pages is that you try to keep things together to kill, make the searching faster, if that makes sense. And uh, then there's the meta page. Uh, yep. It depends on the data type. It's up to the data type author to define that. For example, for the points, uh, the quad tree implementation always branches into four branches. It, like it divides the x and y, the x and y coordinates into quadrants. And then you deep into the, okay, which quadrant is it from here? Which quadrant is it from here? With the three example here with text, uh, it's, uh, it's, you have one branch for each next character uh, in the tree. So that would be, I don't know, 256, I think. I think it works by, by sort of. Uh, but it's, it's, again, it's up to the author of the data type to define that. The interesting characteristic is that it has to 
divide the space um, in, into non-overlapping parts. Uh, good question. Uh, the, no, the, so, so with the SPGs, the pages are just containers for these nodes, so it doesn't, I don't think it's con connected to that. Um, so what can you do with this? Uh, well, those, the, this prefix tree I just showed, uh, but the typical case is uh, to build an index for points. You can't do this for other shapes. You can't do this for boxes or circles or polygons because they might overlap naturally. So you can't divide them neatly into non-overlapping parts because they might actually overlap. Uh, but points can't uh, because they're just singular points. So you can use this to index points. And the reason you would do this instead of the normal gist is that this is uh, faster. Any questions on SPGIST? Okay. So I have more slides on Brin, but I think I'm going to cut it short and uh, let people have lunch. Um, well, I, I'm here if you, someone wants to talk about this, but uh, I think just leave it here. Oh, okay, two minutes. Okay, okay. So Brin index is not a tree. <laughs> it's unlike all of these other t index types. It's not a tree at all. And it's no, no tree of any kind. Uh, you store one entry in the tree, uh, <laughs> in the non-tree, <laughs> for each block, heap block. So there is no PIDs in this thing. It doesn't point to individual tuples. It points to there's one entry for each uh, heap block. It is very small. That's the, the thing it's good for. I'm going to skip through the, this slide and just show what it looks like. Uh, so you have. For each heat block, you store the range of, okay, what is on this heat block? And you store the minimum and maximum value. And then when you search, you scan this whole index, which is very small compared to the table. And uh, the problem with this, or the reason you, you might not want to use this, yeah, Block sure. zero covers n sub n plus 10. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. Covers that <coughs> yeah. Uh, the, defining characteristics of this is that it depends that your heap must be in very good order. It must be sorted or clustered. Otherwise, it's not very good because as soon as you do an update that updates something on every page, then you, you screw up your index because uh, it's not going to be any good anymore. It's, you can do min and max. Uh, you can do normal greater than e equal searches like with the B3, but it's, uh, it's a lot slower than a normal B3, but it's also a lot smaller than a normal B3, and it's faster to update. That's kind of the defining characteristic. And it requires a good natural ordering. So if you, do, if you, if you have a timestamp column that you always, it always increases, that's a good candidate. Or if you cluster every ninth so that your table is so in sorted order because of that, that's a good candidate. But yeah, question. Cluster doesn't work. Cluster, cluster doesn't work? Oh, you mean it doesn't work on a Brin index? Yes. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> so you'd have, yeah, you'd have to create a normal B3 index and then cluster on that. It kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that. We should, probably, we should probably allow clustering on a Brin index, which would mean that we just sort it uh, when you do the clustering. So yeah, that's the summary. We have these index types. and. Uh, any questions at, at this point? No? Everyone hungry? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>